So my lab is interested in the role and regulation of alternative 3' UTRs, and I hope that after my talk, some of you will also be excited about 3' UTRs. Okay, so I want to start by bringing 3' UTRs a little bit into context of gene regulation. As you all know, DNA is transcribed into RNA, but it's transcribed into a primary transcript. And this primary transcript then needs to be processed through several steps of RNA processing into a mature mRNA. And so these steps are capping, splicing, and then at the three prime end, there is cleavage of the primary transcript and the addition of a poly A tail. And so this is very important because only mature mRNAs can be um, exported into the cytoplasm and can be translated. Okay, so here again, you see the central dogma that states that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. And most people regard mRNAs just as the templates for protein synthesis. And this is partially true because the coding region is translated into protein, but an mRNA also has untranslated regions at the five prime end and at the three prime end. And so the three prime UTR is the region between the stop codon and the poly A tail. And I hope that I will be able to convince you today that 3' UTRs actually have important regulatory role and they can mediate or they can determine what are the protein interaction partners of the newly made protein. And, because, um, and this then can um, determine protein functions and protein localization. Okay, so why am I interested in 3' UTRs? So um, when the human genome was sequenced, people were very surprised to find that the number of protein coding genes is very similar to the number of protein coding genes in C. elegans. However, genome size is much larger. So therefore, this led to the notion that um, there are a lot of non-coding elements in the human genome that are really important for um, functions of higher organisms. And one part of the non-coding genome are 3' UTRs. And you can see here that 3' UTRs, are, so the space that is occupied by 3' UTRs is over 10 times larger in humans than in C. elegans. There is also a really nice correlation between 3' UTR length and the number of cell types in an organism, which again suggests that maybe 3' UTRs may play a role in higher organisms. And the other reason why I'm really excited about 3' UTRs is that the presence of the regulatory elements in 3' UTRs can be regulated. So um, a few years ago, we developed um, a sequencing protocol called 3'Seq that allows us to quantitatively map all the 3' ends of the transcriptome. And we found that about half of all human genes make only one 3' UTR. But the other half makes alternative 3' UTRs. So if a proximal polyadenylation signal is used, then an mRNA only contains a very short 3' UTR. However, when a distal polyadenylation signal is used, then the mRNA contains a long 3' UTR. In both cases, the protein that is generated is identical. So the only difference is the presence or absence of the regulatory elements. And it's really intriguing that the, the location of the proximal poly A site is often really um, very close to the stop codon. So using a proximal poly A site often can get rid of basically nearly all the regulatory elements in 3' UTRs. And so we actually think that these two groups of genes are very different because if you look at 3' UTR length, you see that Genes that only make one 3' UTR, the median 3' UTR length is about 500 nucleotides. However, if genes make alternative UTRs, UTR length is really uh, much longer. And so you can see here, as I said before, about half of all human genes make alternative UTRs, and about a quarter makes two isoform, and the other quarter makes uh, more, than, more than two. Most of the time it's three. And so especially those that make more than two um, 3' UTR isoforms, the median 3' UTR length is over 3 kb. And so this is much larger than the coding region. But as I already said, um, now the usage of a proximal poly A signal can get rid of all these regulatory elements. And now these um, short UTR isoforms look actually very similar to these um, genes that only make one 3' UTR. 
because of the large length of, our, of three prime UTRs, they actually have more um, non-coding potential than long non-coding RNAs because the median length of long non-coding RNAs is um, around 500. So three prime UTRs are really a very important part of the non-coding genome. Okay, so three prime UTR isoforms are not static. If we um, compare three prime UTR ratios of different tissues, we see that three prime UTR isoform expression is highly um, cell type specific. But it's also influenced by the environment. So if we take one cell type, like naive B cells, they do not proliferate and they live usually in lymphoid tissues, but they can also be um, in the peripheral blood. So they can basically migrate from one to the other. And so if we then um, harvest naive B cells from these two compartments and we perform three prime seq, we see that actually um, hundreds of genes can um, change the three prime UTI isoform expression. And of course, um, three prime UTRs can also be different in cancer. Um, so here we used um, non-transformed breast epithelial cells where we overexpressed oncogenic RAS and then a few hundred genes change three prime UTI isoform expression. And most of the time when people look, when people compare um, cancer cells and normal cells, they find that cancer cells have shorter three prime UTRs. But I actually think it's mostly true for solid tissues. So this is true for breast and lung and brain, because when we um, sequence here leukemia cells, so those are cells from chronic lymphocytic leukemia, those are B cells, and we compare them um, with their normal counterpart, we actually find that um, the cancer cells have longer three prime UTRs predominantly. And I really would like to say that I don't think it's like shortening or lengthening of UTRs that is important in cancer because actually every gene, so the phenotypic consequence of having a shorter or a longer three prime UTR is very different for each gene. And so if you have an oncogene that, is regula that regulates its abundance through the UTR, if you make a shorter UTR, you um, upregulate protein expression and this can lead to oncogenic transformation. However, I will show you two examples where basically the long three prime UTR isoforms um, have a cancer promoting role. And so therefore I don't think people can generalize that short or long is good or bad. Okay, so those are the facts that um, you should remember about three prime UTRs. So um, genes that make alternative UTRs or have really long three prime UTRs that can become very short when a proximal poly A site is used. And three prime UTRs can change um, their expression ratios in basically nearly every condition. But it's usually only like five to 20% of all the genes that have alternative UTRs that change significantly UTR ratios when we compare two conditions. So it's usually only a, a small fraction. And then as I already said, I think that the phenotypic effect of shorter and longer three prime UTRs really depends on the gene that is affected. Okay, so what, 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 what is the function of three prime UTRs? And so you can see three prime UTRs, they have cis regulatory elements that are bound by RNA binding proteins. And it's very well known that they regulate mRNA stability, translation and localization. But it's not the RNA binding protein itself that is um, responsible to carry out the function. It's basically <coughs> protein interaction partners of the RNA binding proteins. So this RNA binding protein interacts with a motor protein and this leads then to um, a different localization of this mRNA. This RNA binding protein recruits a deadenylase and now this leads to de destabilization of this mRNA. And here this RNA binding protein recruits a decapping enzyme and this leads to translational repression. But in all three cases, um, the fate of the mRNA is affected. Okay, so that's summarized here. And what we recently found is that three prime UTRs can also regulate the fate of the newly made protein. But the principle is really very similar. So there is a UTR that binds an RNA binding protein <coughs> And then the RNA binding protein recruits through protein-protein interactions an effector protein. But now this protein is being loaded onto the newly made protein and forms a protein complex. And now this protein complex has a different function than the protein alone. And so 
this is um, this is the story how we um, found it. So we um, we worked on one of our favorite genes, CD47, and the major reason why we work on it is because it expresses a short and a long three prime UTR, and it's very well known to be um, expressed on the plasma membrane. And if cell, so, basically all cells express it. If they have a high surface expression, then it protects cells from phagocytosis, so it acts as a don't eat me signal. It's known to be expressed at the plasma membrane, and you can see here in red, it is nicely expressed at the cell surface. However, if we permeabilize the cells, we see that a high amount of CD47 is also expressed intracellularly. If we then knock down exclusively the long isoform, we see that intracellular expression remained the same, but surface expression decreased. So this led us to hypothesize it's the long isoform that is responsible for surface expression, and it's the short isoform that is responsible for intracellular expression. And so to test this, we made GFP constructs. So we actually wanted to have just GFP with a long or a short 3' UTR and see how is GFP localized. But CD47 is a membrane protein, so therefore GFP needs to be in a membrane context, so it has transmembrane domains. And so therefore we actually just replaced the extracellular domain of CD47 with GFP. And then we mutated the first poly A site of um, CD47 to have the long UTR versus the short UTR. And then we expressed these constructs, and this was a really nice surprise. So we found that the GFP with the long 3' UTR really nicely localizes to the plasma membrane, whereas GFP with the short UTR is completely expressed intracellularly. And of course, everybody knew that UTRs um, regulate mRNA localization, so then we checked um, where is the RNA localized, and here in red, you see RNA fish of these constructs, and you can see there is no difference in RNA localization. So in both cases, the RNA is localized perinuclear, but when we now um, just um, look at the protein, we see again that CD47 made, or GFP made from the short 3' UTR is localized intracellularly, where the RNA is localized, but CD47 with a long 3' UTR is also localized at the plasma membrane. And in the beginning, this was a real mystery, um, but it was actually not so hard to solve. And um, so I will show you first um, the model, and then I will um, show you the data that support the model. Okay, so if you have CD47 with a long 3' UTR, it binds UR, which is an RNA binding protein, and then it recruits SET. And then after CD47 is translated, SET binds to CD47. SET can also bind to RAC, and then active RAC can transport CD47 to the plasma membrane, shown here. If you have CD47 with a short 3' UTR, there are no UR binding sites, so therefore UR doesn't bind, therefore SET is not recruited to the site of translation, and then CD47 is retained intracellularly. Okay, so um, the three players that are important are UR, SET, and RAC. So if we knock down each one of them, um, we see that um, total CD47 expression, so this is endogenous CD47 expression, doesn't change. But in all three cases, surface expression decreases. And so this shows you that all three um, um, proteins are important for this pathway. Okay, so in the beginning, we didn't, we didn't know that. Um, so we thought, okay, how do we start this? Um, so we actually, the only difference in our constructs is the 3' UTR. So um, we looked at it, so this is the short UTR, this is the long UTR, and already on the first glance, we saw a lot of U-rich elements. And there are actually many um, RNA binding proteins that recognize U-rich elements, but one of them is UR. And this was already shown by several CLIP studies that CD47 is a very good UR target. And so we knocked down UR, as I already showed you, um, but first we actually checked the mRNA levels because it was known that UR regulates mRNA stability, but in the case of CD47, there was no difference in mRNA levels. And I already showed you that protein levels also didn't change, but surface um, expression goes down. 
And here um, we did RNA-IP, where we, where we nicely show that QR really binds to the long 3' UTR, but not to the short 3' UTR. But we wanted to show better specificity because we have so many urich elements and we um, didn't know exactly what to mutate. So therefore, we um, took this region and we asked, can this region replace the long 3' UTR of CD47 and still, be and still can carry out surface localization of GFP? And it can. So if the element is present, then um, we get surface localization, but if we delete the urich element, um, we don't get surface expression. However, this element is not as good as the long 3' UTR. However, in the meantime, we actually have an element that is only 50 nucleotides long that is as good as the long 3' UTR. So that's actually really quite nice because it shows you that maybe there are different, so we have 4,000 nucleotides in the long 3' UTR of CD47, and maybe the other parts do different things. Okay, so this is the most important slide because, um, so here I'm showing you that it's the 3' UTR that is responsible for the interaction between set and CD47. So what we do is um, we use um, GFP CD47 and we pull down on GFP and we ask, does endogenous set bind? So here. So you can see if we pull down GFP, then endogenous set binds only when CD47 was made from the long 3' UTR isoform. And endogenous set does not bind when CD47 was made by the short 3' UTR isoform. And so this is the cartoon, and it really um, demonstrates that it's the long 3' UTR that is necessary for the protein-protein interaction between set and CD47. And this is really important because I will show you other examples where we have other 3' UTRs that can recruit proteins to the site of translation. And then, of course, um, oh no. Um, so then we um, actually wanted to know how does, CD40, uh, how does SET interact with CD47? And we um, found, so SET is actually very acidic and it binds to positively charged amino acids in the C terminus as well as in the first loop. And if we mutate all the five Ks here, then we abrogate um, surface localization shown here. So we, we, we know exactly the binding sites of set, and it's based on electrostatic interactions. So how it's just a model, but how we envision um, the transfer to happen is this. So we have the long 3' UTR that binds UR, and UR is also positively charged, and it binds the really highly negatively charged set. So now CD47 is made. And the um, cytoplasmic domains of CD47 are actually more positively charged than QR. And so now basically SET is an opportunist and it then goes to the higher positive charge of CD47 and is transferred from QR to CD47. But you might ask, um, why does SET not interact with CD47 protein that was made by the short 3' UTR? Because it's exactly the same protein. And we are still working on that, but we have some ideas. And this is one of the models that we are pursuing. So we really, th so for electrostatic interactions to occur, um, you're not allowed to have water. And so we think that um, if the UTR doesn't recruit set, then um, CD47, the newly made CD47, is surrounded by water, and set is surrounded by water. And then um, basically, the electrostatic, um, um, the charges cannot see each other, and therefore they cannot interact. However, when you have the long 3' UTR, we think that the long 3' UTR generates some kind of RNA granule with a hydrophobic interior, and this enables um, the transfer to happen. And that's basically visualized here. So we actually don't know um, how big the RNA granule is, um, so it could be very small that it's basically just surrounding the UTR, and it creates a microenvironment that enables the transfer of proteins from the 3' UTR to the nascent protein. Or maybe it's bigger, and all of this happens in an RNA granule. So that's basically pure fantasy, um, but so this is something that we are thinking about. Okay, so 
for CD47, we found that QR binds to the 3' UTR, and then, so we ask, what are the determinants that a protein needs to use the system to localize to the plasma membrane? Because we wanted to know, is CD47 the only protein that uses the UTR to localize to the, to the cell surface? And so, what you need is, you need QR binding sites in the 3' UTR. They are very abundant. Basically, nearly all 3' UTRs have U-rich elements. And then you need positively charged in the cytoplasmic domains of membrane proteins, because this is where SEP binds. And that's actually also very abundant, because membrane proteins need to know which part is extracellular and which part is intracellular. And so to, to decide the topology, they have an enrichment of positively charged amino acids in the cytoplasmic domains. So basically, all membrane proteins have comply this com with this cr um, criterion. And really, nearly all 3' UTRs have UR binding sites. So we thought, hmm, these um, criteria are actually very abundant. And so we tested the next five candidates, and really all of them worked. So if we um, express um, these, um, these proteins, either from the short or the long 3' UTR isoform, you can see in all, in all three cases that if we add the long 3' UTR, we get higher surface localization. And so we concluded that um, 3' UTR mediated protein localization to the plasma membrane might be really widespread and that actually many membrane proteins use that. Okay, but then, um, so in the beginning, it was all about protein localization because our first um, image was so convincing because we saw GFP intracellularly and GFP at the plasma membrane. Um, but then after a while, we thought, okay, so this is CD47. And as I already said in the beginning, surface CD47 is the only known CD47. And if you look here at this northern blot, you can see that this is the long isoform which is responsible for plasma membrane localization of CD47. And in basically all cell types, they make much more CD47 short. And we thought this is probably not a mistake, and we really wanted to know then um, what the function was. But first I want to show you the data that it's actually really um, CD47 with a long 3' UTR that is responsible for that. So as I said, it's, it's also called um, a don't eat me signal. And so how you test that is, so you incubate your cells with macrophages, you wait three days, and you ask how many cells survive this procedure. If cells um, express a lot of CD47 at the plasma membrane, they survive, and triggered cells express a lot of CD47, then we also have CD47 negative triggered cells, and most of these cells die because they are being phagocytosed by the macrophages. Now we take these um, CD47 negative triggered cells and we re-express CD47 LU or CD47 SU. And you can nicely see if we re-express CD47 LU, we completely rescue the phenotype, but if we express CD47 SU, we only partially um, rescue this phenotype, which demonstrates that it's CD47 LU, that is surface CD47 with a very well-known function. But as I already um, said, it was a complete mystery to us was what CD47 intracellular would do. Okay, so, um, so then we turned to the CD47 knockout mouse because we thought the CD47 knockout mouse lacks both isoforms. What's the phenotype? And so it actually has a really striking phenotype. If you irradiate a normal mouse, you induce tissue damage and inflammation and alopecia, and if you do this, the same thing to the CD47 knockout mouse, nothing happens. It's really completely resistant against tissue damage. This phenotype is also true for cells. So you can use triggered cells and you irradiate them and they die. But if you use CD47 negative triggered cells, they survive. So then we used again the CD47 negative triggered cells and we re-expressed our constructs. So if we re-express CD47 LU, nothing happens. So the phenotype is still as if there is no CD47 in the cell. So this means that surface CD47 does really not contribute at all to the cell death phenotype. However, if we re-express CD47 SU, 
now we can rescue the knockout phenotype. And I think this is a very, really important um, slide because despite the fact that it's the same protein, here it's expressed at the plasma membrane and it does not contribute to the cell death phenotype and it's only CD47SU which is localized intracellularly that um, is responsible for the cell death phenotype that you can see, um, I mean, that is rescued in the CD47 knockout mouse. Okay, so now everybody was confused because now CD47 can have a pro-survival and an anti-survival function. If the cells are um, exposed to oxidative stress, if they contain CD47, they die. If the cells don't contain CD47, they survive. However, if they are exposed to macrophage, it's the other way around. So now CD47 has a pro-survival role and the knockout um, cells die. However, if you then take into account the 3D prime UTR, everything becomes um, logical again. So it's always CD47LU that has a pro-survival function, and it's always CD47SU that has a pro-cell death function. Okay, so then we thought, how does CD47SU actually induce cell death? Okay, so then we wanted to identify the 3 prime UTR dependent protein interaction partners of CD47. So we again have our GFP fusion constructs. We express them in cells. We cultivate them in silic media. And then um, we do a pull down and we ask, what are the interaction partners of CD47 that depend on the presence of the long 3 prime UTR? And what are the, the interaction partners of CD47 that only interact with CD47 when it was made by the short 3 prime UTR? And in this analysis, we only focus on the interaction partners of CD47SU. So these numbers here are the fold enrichment of the interaction partner. So how much better does the interaction partner bind to um, CD47SU than to CD47LU? And if you go down this list, we found a lot of proteins that localize to mitochondria. With, um, on, the, on the list of CD47SU, and we did not find any mitochondrial proteins, at least not um, in the high enrichment, with the high enrichment values for CD47LU. I mean, it makes sense because CD47LU localizes to the plasma membrane and should not interact with mitochondrial proteins. So this list then suggested this, that CD47SU actually localizes to mitochondria. So then we validated several of these interaction partners, but I'm only showing you two here. So as a control, we have CD47LU that I already showed you um, interacts with SET here, but CD47SU does not interact with SET. Instead, it interacts with SYNJ2BP, which is also com called OM25, but CD47LU does not at all interact with OM25. And here's another example. Again, LU interacts with SET, SU does not. Instead, SU interacts with um, OPA1, but LU does not interact with OPA1. And so this really shows you that it's the three prime UTRs that determine the, the, the protein interaction partners of CD47. We were really um, um, excited to find OPA1 in our list because OPA1 is one of the master regulators of mitochondrial health. And so, and we wanted to solve how CD47 kills cells. And so um, CD47 does not only interact with OPA1, it actually also changes OPA1 isoform expression. So this is OPA1. OPA1 is a little bit complicated, but the only thing that you need to know is it makes five isoforms. Two are called long OPA1 and three are called short OPA1. So A and B are the good ones. So if you have a lot of long OPA1, it promotes cell survival. If you have a lot of the short OPA1, which is um, produced through proteolytic cleavage, um, it leads to um, apoptosis. And if you now look at our knockout cells, you see if cells have CD47, they have less of long OPA and they have more of short OPA. And so basically, if you don't have, oh, sorry, here. 
Um, so yeah, if you don't have CD47, you have make much more of long OPA, which basically promotes cell survival. And this is how the knockout cells um, can um, avoid cell death. And we can rescue the effect of CD47. So if cells have CD47 and you stress them, then they die. But if you then re-express long OPA, you can, um, rescue the, the, um, you can rescue cell death. And so we think that CD47SU localizes to mitochondria and interacts with several mitochondrial proteins and regulates cell death through the interaction. And so that's basically summarized here, where, where I'm showing you that CD47 can lead to cell survival, but it can also lead to cell death. And it's the 3' UTR dependent protein interaction partners that are responsible for this. So CD47LU, interacts with Z. This leads to plasma membrane localization. It acts as a don't eat me signal. CD47SU does not interact with Z. Instead, it interacts with OPA1 and others. And then this leads to um, cell death. So then we wondered, so this is a membrane protein. Can only, can only UTRs of membrane proteins recruit protein interaction partners? Or can basically also cytosolic and nuclear proteins do this? Okay, um, so to identify um, a good candidate where we actually wanted to know what the long isoform does, um, my postdoc Peggy Lee, she, um, she sequenced a lot of normal B cells and CLL cells. Those are um, chronic lymphocytic um, leukemia cells. And so um, this was done in collaboration with Christina Leslie. And so we identified 3' UTR um, isoform expression and this was one of our top candidates because we focused on genes where total mRNA levels didn't change between normal and malignant cells. Only the 3' UTR isoform ratio should change in a significant manner. And this was our top, one of our top candidates because basically in all CLL samples, we saw a change towards um, higher expression of the long 3' UTR isoform. So um, BERG3 is an E3 ubiqu ubiquitin ligase. It's already known to be overexpressed in several cancers. And overexpression protects from apoptosis, and it's also um, involved in NF-kappa B signaling. And so we did um, the usual experiment. We used cells that endogenously express BERG3. We then knocked down exclusively the long isoform, and we asked, what is the phenotype? And so first, um, um, he um, did a lot of cell death assays because it was known that cells are protected from apoptosis, but she never found any difference if the cells contained both short and long or only the short um, isoform of BRC3. However, she found that the cells um, had a different migratory capacity towards the cytokine called CXCL12, which means that the long 3' UTI isoform of BRC3 is required for the migration towards the cytokine. So the receptor for the cytokine is CXCR4. And the reason why these cells have a problem in migration is because surface expression of the receptor is decreased if the long isoform of Burke is absent. And in the end, she found that these cells have less CXCR4 on the cell surface because they have a recycling um, defect. And of course, um, we wanted to know how does Berg LU regulate recycling of the receptor CXCR4? We did the same experiment that we did for CD37. So we expressed GFP constructs, Berg, with either the short or the long 3' UTR. Then we do quantitative mass spec analysis. And then we actually got hundreds um, of candidates that bind much better to Berg when in the presence of the long 3' UTR. I'm only showing you two here because um, Peggy then selected two known candidates that were in the list that were already known to regulate CXCR4 recycling. And they are IQGAP and RAL-A. And so this time it's not so black and white, but you can still see that it's Berg LU that interacts better with IQ gap and RAL A, better than um, Berg that was made by the short 3' UTR. 
And so our model is um, that the long 3' UTR binds RNA binding proteins that then recruit RAL A and IQ gap to the site of translation. And then IQ gap and RAL A bind better to BARC than when um, BARC was made by the short 3' UTR. So then we asked, what is the RNA binding protein that can recruit these two, um, two effector proteins? And so here you can see again, so Berg lu binds um, IQ gap and RAL A better than Berg su And again, it's UR. We actually think there are other RNA binding proteins that are also important, um, but Berg also, of course, has um, U-rich elements in the 3' UTR, and this was one of the first ones um, she tested. And if she knocks down UR, you can see that the interaction goes back to, ba to background levels in both cases. And so this shows you that for IQ gap and RAL A to interact with Berg, you need the long 3' UTR and you need UR because in the presence of the short 3' UTR, you have much less um, IQ gap and RAL A interaction than if, than if you have the long 3' UTR, but if you deplete UR, then you have only background um, interaction levels. So it's again probably UR. Okay, then we ask, so we wondered how does Bark lu regulate CXCR4 recycling? And then we, we ask, does BARC actually directly interact with the receptor? So now we pull down, so now we pull down the receptor and we see that BARC interacts with the receptor no matter what. So you don't need the 3' UTR. So if you have no 3' UTR, if you have a short 3' UTR, if the long UTR, in all cases, BARC definitely interacts with CXCR4. But the interesting result is shown here. So this, so remember this, we pull down on the receptor CXCR4, BARC binds, but only in the presence of the long 3' UTR of BARC, or be, better to say is the protein that was made from the long 3' UTR isoform. Only in that case, IQ gap interacts with CXCR4 but if only bark that was made from the short 3' UTR is in the test tube, um, IQ gap does not interact with CXCR4. So this shows you clearly that it's the long 3' UTR of bark is required for the interaction between IQ gap and CXCR4. And we think what's happening is this, um, both bark, short and long, can interact with CXCR4. However, Bark lu was already preloaded with IQ gap and RAL A, and therefore already brings IQ gap and RAL A with it, and now they localize to the to CXCR4, and they are both known um, regulators of CXCR4 recycling, and this does not happen in the case of the short 3' UTR, because um, Bark made from the short 3' UTR binds IQ gap and RAL A much less. And so again, this shows you that, um, that the long 3' UTR has a different function. I mean, the protein that was made from the long 3' UTR has a different function than the protein that was made by the short 3' UTR. Okay, so if you don't take into account the 3' UTR, this is um, how it looks like. Um, okay, so um, you have normal cells and malignant cells, and they both express identical amounts of Berg protein. However, if you take into account the 3' UTR, then it looks a little bit like this. So in dark, you have Berg protein that was made from the long isoform, and in light green, you have Berg protein that was made from the short isoform. And so you can already see in the malignant cells, you have more of Berg lu And so Berg lu seems to be important in the malignant cells. And now, um, there are 3' UTR dependent protein interaction partners, but we actually think that not every Berg molecule, Berg lu molecule, binds to IQ gap and RAL A. So there are other LU molecules that probably have other um, UTR dependent protein interaction partners. And so we think that it's the abundance of the protein complexes that determine the function of the protein. And some of these protein complexes can be determined by the 3' UTR. 
And so if this is actually true that also these other um, LU molecules have different interaction partners because we actually um, pulled down hundreds of interaction partners for BARC3, um, this may suggest that um, long 3' UTRs enable multifunctionality of proteins. Okay, so now I showed you two examples. And um, in both cases, the long 3' UTR can recruit many um, protein interaction partners. Then we wondered, how specific is this? Can actually every UTR do this? And are always the same proteins recruited? And how is specificity achieved? And to basically start to address this, we um, did our favorite experiment for actually many candidates, and I'm showing you six. In all cases, they make um, short and long three prime UTRs. I think it's dying. Okay, here it is. Okay, what I'm showing you here is um, the top 20 um, interaction partners for these six candidates that are recruited by each of their long three prime UTRs. And then we wondered, are are these interaction partners also found um, by the other candidates? And so you can see that most of this, so most of this is white. Despite the fact that these experiments were done in the exact same cell type, we don't even pull down, um, we don't pull down um, the interaction partners that we pull down, let's say, with um, our first candidate. And so we interpret this that each UTR can recruit different interaction partners to the site of translation, and so it's the UTR together with the nascent protein that determine the specificity. And so this is basically shown in cartoon form here. Um, so we think that we have, okay, so we have a long three prime UTR that binds RNA binding proteins, and probably it binds many more than I, that I'm showing you here. And then each RNA binding protein then can recruit by protein-protein interactions many interaction partners. And we call them the recruited proteins. But out of these many recruited proteins, there are only very few that then can specifically interact with um, a, dom a protein domain in the newly made protein. And then they can be transferred onto the newly made protein. And so therefore, we think the specificity is achieved by the UTR as well as by the protein domains in the newly made protein. Okay, so what I showed you is that we think that short three prime UTRs um, generate proteins that are basically um, naked. And um, long three prime UTRs can use their, their, their three prime UTRs to recruit three prime UTR dependent protein interaction partners. And this can lead to um, protein complex formation. And then um, the protein complex here has a different function than the protein alone. And you can of course imagine if the recruited protein is an enzyme, then it can um, post-translationally modify the nascent protein in a three prime UTR dependent manner. Or if the recruited protein already binds co-translationally, you can also imagine that this can then change the folding and the function of the protein. And with this I wanna end. Um, I wanna thank the people um, who did the work. Um, this is Benjamin Berkowitz. He um, did the majority of the CD47 work. This is Peggy Lee. Um, she did the Burke project with help of Sophia Lee. And this is Elchisha Singh. She did our computational an analysis. And I'm happy to take questions. In order to f further um, illustrate or analyze your last point, have you tried connecting uh, UTRs, two coding sequences in trans. In a way, two proteins, you swap their UTRs and actually then see that there is no proper localization. Yeah, um, so we, we are in the process of doing this. Um, so we already have swapped UTRs and we see, so we didn't look at localization. We basically looked for, do we get different protein interaction partners? And we, we, we do. So therefore we already, I mean, we, we know that the UTR definitely is one part of the specificity, but we, we still need to do more work on that.
So uh, have you tried playing around with, with uh, taking the same UTR, cutting it in half, and then sort of swapping the, the order of the halves? In other words, the elements that are recruiting the protein, does it matter where they are in the UTR? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, we didn't do a swapping experiment, but um, we did a lot of, so we, um, we, we did a lot of experiments with the UTR pieces. And what we learned is, so especially with the CD47 UTR, so we have a lot of these urich elements. And actually, nearly all of them work if you take them out of context, because then they seem to be accessible. But in the context of the long 3' UTR, many of them are not accessible. And so it really depends, so of course, other people look at RNA structure, and so we actually, people already suggested that, that it's the end of the 3' UTR that is better accessible, and so we really think that it's the ends of the UTR, so the end of the long, uh, of the short 3' UTR, the end of the middle UTR, the end of the long 3' UTR, this is where most of the action actually happens. But, I mean, we have some data that support this, yeah. I was going to ask why the, um, you think in the case of CD47, the long isoforms don't uh, bind the upper one and locate to the mitochondria. So have you just answered that, that it's sort of a structural constraint, or might, might it be different kinetics of interaction with those proteins? So, so CD47, when, when made from the long 3' UTR, always interacts with SET. And I think that SET basically binds to the same region that later the mitochondrial interaction partners bind to. So if you have the long UTR, SET binds, and then it immediately goes to the plasma membrane, and it's no longer available to bind to something else. If SET doesn't bind, now you have these protein domains available, and now other proteins can bind. In the case of CD47, I actually think it's the default localization. So we are still not sure if you actually really need the short UTR or if this is just protein localization by CD47. And so um, it could be that the default localization of CD47 is to the mitochondria. But if you have the long UTR, then you bind set, and now you do something different. So I'll. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind. So I have a question about stoichiometry because um, in your, if I understand your experiments correctly, you're overexpressing these three prime UTRs when you're pulling down. And so to what extent, you know, we know that these RNA proteins aren't very specific and so forth. And so is, is the lack of overlap just because you're in an overexpression sy uh, system, you know, and, and to what extent is there more specificity that's just governed by relative ratios of proteins? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we um, do these experiments in stable cells that don't express these fusion constructs to a very high extent. And we also um, noticed, so especially if you overexpress RNA binding proteins, everything gets out of control. Um, so we are not doing that. Um, is the protein actually in the cell? Because if it's a membrane protein, that would be rather unusual. Is, it, is the protein made? So in the mitochondria, is the protein present? Yes. So it's, um, it's a membrane protein with five transmembrane domains, and it's localized to the inner mitochondrial membrane. Yeah. I didn't show that yeah. because yeah. I thought this is not a mitochondrial audience, so I skipped all the mitochondrial data. Yes, yeah. You would get, I mean, do you get sort of like spots of RNAs or do, is it basically one, can you assess this in any way? Yeah, so we, um, we did some imaging. So we actually see some granules, but I'm actually really not sure if this is really meaningful. Um, we are really not sure about the size, so it actually could be that they are very small and not like P, P granules or stress granules and P bodies. And so we are really not sure about that. But so we really think that RNA granules are always formed if you have RNA and protein together. And what we know is um, you are 
although it looks so. It depends on your um, def definition of sufficient. So we know that UR is sufficient in terms of if you have UR alone, you can bring something to the plasma membrane. But if you have the long 3' UGR, it goes much better. And with our piece of 50 nucleotides, we are now basically looking what are the other proteins that are really required for this to happen very efficiently and not just a little bit. And so, um, but we are still doing these experiments to see. So the RNA granule is a model, okay? I can tell you other models that we are also pursuing, but this is our favorite model. An RNA granule for me is just um, an, RN, uh, an mRNP. But we, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, um, I'm here. Um, do you already have an idea about the RNA binding motive, so the sequence on the RNA where it binds the proteins? Maybe that can be used to classify the function or predict the function of the 3' UTR? Yeah, so um, for UR, it's known. I mean, UR binds to A, U, or U-rich regions. And so in both cases, BARC and CD47, I mean, basically nearly every UTR has some UR binding sites when we look at the sequence where you think, oh, okay, this might be a good one. But so we actually usually do RNA IP to really see if it actually really binds. Um, this. It's a, still a, a big mystery for me what happens on, on the UTR side. So right now we approach everything from the protein side. We do these protein pull downs and we really see um, UTR specific interaction partners and we can validate them and they are all real. So now we need to connect it to the RNA and then it becomes really complicated and dirty and no, and we are really um, struggling a little bit with that. So we know that UR binds to urid regions, but we think that other RNA binding proteins are equally involved. It's not just UR, it's just that we are very familiar with it. And so, yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, hi. Um, so you propose that the, the, the local binding with, through the long UTR creates a local microenvironment that allows for the protein interaction. But would you also think that the absolute abundance of the interacting protein will be important, as in low abundance proteins will be more sensitive to this because the local concentration will be important? Yeah, I mean, so we think that the UTR one thing that the UTR can do is it can increase the local concentration through recruitment, right? And so that's definitely, um, so in the beginning we thought this is how, s this is important for SET. But for SET it was not important because we can overexpress SET dramatically and SET never interacts with CD47 SU. And then we thought, okay, um, okay, there could be a post-translational modification that happens if, Set, set is not around, so set immediately binds when the protein is made. If it not immediately binds, something else could modify this binding site and then set cannot bind to it anymore. But we have no evidence for that, and so right now we are, we are pursuing this model. Mm -hmm. an important part in these um, granules. Yeah, yeah, I don't have any data, but this is our favorite hypothesis. Do you know if the ratios between sh um, short UTRs and long UTRs change over different stages of the cell life cycle? Okay, so the vast majority of cell types that we looked at express more of the short isoform of CD47. But we thought a ratio change in CD47 would actually give the cell a really big advantage. So n normal cells mostly express mostly the short, very little of the long, which is basically a pro-cell death ratio. If you now do the opposite, so now you have more of the lung, so you can protect cells from phagocytosis, and at the same time, you can protect cells from apoptosis through oxidative stress. It's a double advantage. And so then we thought cancer cells probably have interest in doing that. And so we actually looked at chronic myeloid leukemia cells, so primary 
stem cells from patients and we actually really see a very dramatic ratio change and they go exactly into this more um, cell survival promoting ratio. I didn't show the data. Hi, um, I've just got a question about the mechanism of the UTR length switching itself. So I think you said that uh, in the systems you looked at, you didn't see any particular bias towards long or short, but it was a mixture of two that you could see in, in the systems that you looked at. But does that mean that the, the mechanism is transcript specific for long, lengthening and shortening the UTR? Or do you think there's general mechanisms to control the which uh, UTR length is used? I actually think it's very gene specific. So when we um, look at different conditions, it's always really only a very small fraction of genes that change. And if we then look at a different condition, it's a very different set of genes that change. And so it's very hard to predict. So I actually really think it's, it has a lot of layers of regulation. It's not just RNA binding proteins, it's also chromatin, it's promoters, maybe tr transcription elongation. So I, my personal opinion is that it's, it's how mRNA abundance is regulated. And it actually could be that these two isoforms may be even independent so that you have a transcript that basically makes the short UTR, and then you have a transcript that makes the long UTR. And you regulate each one of them, like just how you regulate mRNAs. I'm not saying that this is true, but this could be true. And so I really think that everything that applies to how mRNA abundance levels are regulated also applies to how 3' UTR isoforms are regulated. And I think it's probably a little bit misleading because we always talk about ratios and shortening and lengthening, and this implies that they are somehow connected. Um, I'm not sure if there is really a any evidence for that. A lot of um, long non uh, sorry, 3' UTRs are post-transcriptionally cleaved and capped. Any evidence for this in the genes that you've looked at? And do you think it might be a way of sponging RNA binding proteins, regulating the assembly of these complexes? Yeah, that's a good question. So we um, have really never looked at this. So we did a lot of northern blots, and we actually, um, we actually never see just the pieces of the UTR because we, so we usually use probes in the coding region and then we see short and long. And then we use a probe also in, just in the UTR. And then you would actually see the long isoform, but also a cleavage product that is not so long. And we, we have actually never seen that for any, I mean, we probably did, did it on 150 or so. And so therefore, um, I mean, I know that this data exists, but we have never seen it. Hi, this is a general question from maybe an outsider's perspective. I was just thinking about the evolution of three prem UTRs, what we know about that alternative polyadenylation, the sort of biological pathways you talk about. I mean, are we seeing sort of ancient biology here or more rapidly evolving lineage specific stuff in general, do you think? Okay, so um, in the beginning, I thought that you really need long UTRs for this to happen. And therefore, I presented a little bit black and white because I say that the protein that is made by the short UTR basically is only the protein. This is probably incorrect because we recently, we, we know for sure that our piece that is only 50 nucleotides long that can replace in terms of, if we only wanna um, replace set binding, it can replace the long 3' UTR. So therefore, you only basically need a UTR of 50 nucleotides to do this. Okay, so then C. elegans, the median or the average or median length of the 3' UTR is 110. C. elegans can also do that. Um, yeast has also 110 or 120. So Initially, I thought maybe these lower organisms didn't do this. I, now I think actually um, they probably can. Maybe you get a real advantage by having many of these elements, and now you can give it many more functions, because if maybe one function is mediated by an element of 50, then there is still the problem of accessibility, but you can still have several, and so 
but those are just ideas and um, I'm just speculating here.